morning, guys. I'm here at 6.30 in the morning to try to record this all in one go. So here we go. Chapter 20. When we left off in 19, she, Katniss had sussed out. That means she had just, she had figured out that if she does what Hamish wants, he will give her gifts. So she kisses Peta to shut him up. She gets a thing of broth. So she's like, okay, I got to play all this up because he's not going to give me something really big, like something to fix Peta or real food besides broth, unless I actually do something bigger, play up the romance more. So let's see how Katniss does this. Getting the broth into Peta takes an hour of coaxing, begging, threatening, and yes, kissing. But finally, sip by sip, he empties the pot. I let him drift off into a sleep, and then I attend my own needs, wolfing down a supper of goosling and roots while I watch a daily report in the sky. New, no new casualties. Still, Peta and I have given the audience a fairly interesting day. Hopefully, the game makers will allow us a peaceful night. I automatically look around for a good tree to, rest, to nest in before I realize that's over. Literally, she's going to leave him on the ground wounded? Kind of goes against the I love PETA thing, right? At least for a while. I can't very well leave PETA unguarded on the ground. I left the, scene, I left the scene of his last hiding place on the bank of the stream untouched. How could I conceal it? And we're a scant 50 yards downstream. I put on my glasses, place my weapons in readiness, and settle down to keep watch. The temperature drops rapidly, and soon I'm ch chilled to the bone. Evidently I, I, eventually, I give in and slide into the sleeping bag with PETA. It's toasty warm, and I snuggle down gratefully until I realize it's more than warm. It's overly hot because the bag is reflecting back his fever. I check his forehead and find it burning and dry. I don't know what to do. Uh, the dry is really scary because your body will naturally sweat in order to cool itself off. If he's not doing that, we're talking dehydration. We're talking the body not fun the lymph body's lymphatic system not working correctly. So that's really scary. I don't know what to do. Leave him in the bag and hope for the excess heat breaks the fever. May take him out and hope the night air cools him off. I end up just dampening a strip of bandage and placing it on his forehead. It seems weak, but I'm afraid to do anything else, anything too drastic. I spend the night half sitting, half laying next to Peter, refreshing the bandage and trying not to dwell on the fact that my, by teaming up with him, I made myself far more vulnerable than when I was alone. Tethered to the ground, on guard, with a very sick person to take care of. But I know he was I know he was injured, and still I came after him. I'm just going to have to trust that whatever instinct sent me to find him was a good one. When the sky turns rosy, I notice a sheen of sweat on Peter's lip and discover the fever is broken. He's not back to normal, but it's come down a few degrees. Last night, when I was gathering vines, I came upon a bush of bruised berries. I strip off the fruit and mash it up into a pot into the pot broth pot with cold water. Peter's struggling to get up when I reach the cave. I woke up and you were gone, he says. I was worried about you. I have to laugh at E and ease him back down. You were worried about me. Have you taken a look at yourself lately? I thought Cato or Clove might have found you. They like to hunt at night, he says, still serious. Clove, which one is that? The girl from District 2. She's still alive, right? He says. Yes. There's just them and us and Thrush and Foxface, I say. That's what I nicknamed the girl from 5. How do you feel? Better than yesterday. This is an enormous improvement over the mud, he says. Clean clothes and medicine and a sleeping bag and you. Oh, right, the whole romance thing. I reach out and touch his cheek and he catches my hand and presses it against his lips. I remember my father doing this very thing with my mother and I wonder where Peter picked it up. Surely not from his father and the witch. No more kisses for you until you've eaten, I say. We've got him propped up against a wall and he obediently swallows a spoonful of berry mush and I, I feed him. He refuses the grisling again, though. You didn't sleep, Peter says. I'm all right, but the truth is, I'm exhausted. Sleep now. I'll keep watch. I'll wake you if anything happens, he says. I hesitate. Katniss, you can't stay up forever. He got the point. He's got the point. He's got a point there. I'll have to sleep eventually, and probably better to do it now when he seems relatively alert when, we're near, when we have daylight on our side. All right, I say, but just for a few hours, and then you have to wake me. It's too warm for the sleeping bag now, and I soothe it out onto the cave floor and lie down, one hand on my loaded bow in case I have to shoot at a moment's notice. Peter sits beside me, leaning against the wall, his bag, bad legs stretched out before him, his eyes trained on the world outside. Go to sleep, he says softly. His hand brushes the loose strands of my hair off my forehead. Unlike the staged kisses and caresses so far, this gesture seems natural and comforting. I don't want him to stop, and he doesn't. He's still stroking my hair when I fall asleep. 
Too long. I sleep too long. I know from the moment I open my eyes that we're into the afternoon. Pete is right beside me, his position unchanged. I sit up, feeling somehow defensive, but better rested than I've been for days. Pete, you were supposed to wake me after a couple of hours, I say. For what? Nothing's going on here, he says. Besides, I like to watch you sleep. You don't scowl. Proves your looks a lot. This, of course, brings on a scowl that makes him grin. That's when I notice how dry his lips are. I test his cheek. He's hot as a coal stove. He claims he's been drinking, but the containers I are still feel full to me. I give him more fever pills and stand over him while he drinks the first one and then the second quart of water. When I tend to his whiner wounds, the burns, the stings, which are showing improvement, I steel myself to unwrap the leg. My heart drops into my stomach. It's worse. Much worse. There's no more pus in evidence, but the swelling has increased and the tight, shiny skin is inflamed. When I see the red streaks starting to crawl up his leg, blood poisoning. Unchecked, it would kill him for sure. My chewed up leaves and ointment won't make a dent in it. We'll, we'll, see, we'll need strong anti-infection drugs from the capital. I can't imagine the cost of such a potent medicine. If Hamish pooled every do donation from every sponsor, would he have enough? I doubt it. Gifts go up in price the longer the games continue. What buys a full mill on day one buys a cracker on day 12. And that, that kind of medicine PETA needs, needs would have to be a bit at a premium from the beginning. Well, there's more swelling, but the pus is gone, I say in an unsteady voice. I know what blood poisoning is, Katniss, says Peta, even if my mother isn't a healer. You're just going to have to outlast the others, Peta. They'll cure, cure you back in the capital when we win, I say. Yes, that's a good plan, he says, but I feel this is mostly for my benefit. You have to eat. Keep your strength up. I'm going to make you some soup, I say. Don't light a fire. It's not worth it. We'll see, I say. As I take the pot down to the stream, I'm stuck by how brutally hot it is. I swear the game makers are progressively ratcheting up the temperature in the daytime and sending it plummeting at night. The heat of the sun-baked stones by the stream gives me an idea, though. Maybe I won't need to light a fire. I settle down by a big flat rock halfway between the stream and the cave. After purifying half a pot of water, I place it in the direct sunlight and add several egg-sized hot stones into water. At first, I admit it's not much. I'm not much of a cook, but then soup mainly involves tossing everything in the pot and waiting. It's one of the better. Di it's one of my better dishes. I mince grusling into a practically a mush and mash some of roots. Roots. Fortunately, they have been roasted already, so they mostly need to be heated up. Already, between the sunlight and the rocks, the water's warm. I put in the meat and roots and swap out fresh rocks and then go find something green to spice it up a bit. Before long, I discover a tuft of chives growing at the base of some of the rocks. Perfect. I chop them very fine and add them to the pot, which I switch out from the rocks again, put on the lid, and let the whole thing stew. I've seen very few signs of game around, but I don't feel comfortable leaving PETA alone while I hunt. So I bring half a dozen snares, hope I get lucky. I wonder about the other tributes, how they're managing, how their main source of food has been blown up. At least three of them, Cato, Clove, and Foxface, have been relying on it. Probably not Thresh, though. I've got a feeling that he must share some of Rue's knowledge on how to feed himself in the earth. Are they fighting each other, looking for us? Maybe one of them has located us and is waiting for the right moment to attack. The idea sends me back to the cave. Okay, guys, now we got some answers that we can actually do. Now, this is a quick write over here on slide two. Is lying wrong? Is it ever okay to lie to somebody? Explain your response. Guys, I'm looking for at least six to seven sentences here. Because first, we're going to talk about we have to give your claim. So you're going to tell me, is it right or is it wrong? Please don't start with the word yes or no. I really hate that. And don't start with I believe or in my opinion. You're just stating fact here. So, lying is always wrong. Lying isn't always wrong. Super easy there. Is it ever okay to lie to someone? If you say no, then you have to explain to me why it's never okay to lie. And I'm going to pick you apart on that. And then you're going to have to give me an explanation, an example of why it's never okay to lie. Then, if you're going to say, yes, it is okay to lie to some people sometimes, you're going to tell me under what circumstances. Then you're going to give me an explanation of why it's okay. We're talking a lot of work here. I definitely want the claim, and then I want the reason, and then I'm going to definitely need an example or evidence to prove that you're correct. And then you have to tell me why your example is correct. This is at least four to five sentences. Come on, come on. Now, I'd love six to seven if you get real good at this, but I'll take five minimum. Now, we're going to go over here to the other side. 
How do they, these characters use the TV cameras to manipulate? What do they hope to gain? Katniss, she definitely ratchets up the romance in hopes of getting the medicine for PETA. Her entire thing is she needs to get supplies she needs. PETA. Now, does he use the cameras? Yes, he's used them in the past. He definitely does the entire, you know, I betrayed Katniss, but not really act in order to save Katniss. The Capitol, they definitely use those TV cameras to keep the Capitol citizens happy and to send out, we will kill you if you try to rebel, messages to all the other districts. What do they hope to gain? Compliance from the masses. Game makers, they use those key TV cameras to hook in those capital people to make them watch this so it, gave, it makes more money for their economy. But also, the game makers use these cameras in order to show, yes, we can punish you. Katniss pissed us off. We threw fireballs at her. Cinna. Cinna uses the, ca the cameras to manipulate Katniss's per or the audience's perception of Katniss. He literally makes them think what he wants them to think about her. And why does he do it? In order to help her get sponsors so that she can win the games. Let's go to slide three, shall we? Ha, I'm going to re-ask that question I asked the very first day, guys. How can using individual strengths and or intelligences help people survive? What is the importance of allies and survival? This is a lot to answer because you need to give me examples for each. So is intelligence, uh, how, I'm sorry, how is using individual intel strengths and or intelligence help someone survive? We can talk about Rue knowing about berries and roots helps her eat when she can't hunt. We have Katniss who can hunt, who that keeps her alive and keeps protein, but she needs more food, different types of food because she can't leave off protein alone. Sorry, my little carnivores. Then you have, what is the importance of allies and survival? You know, Cato is allied to cloves from the very beginning. Then we have Rue and Katniss, but what does that do to Katniss? And then Peta definitely has to have an alliance with Katniss or he would have died on a, on a riverbank. So we have a lot to talk about there. And I'm looking for about four to five sentences. Now, going over on the other side, we have, again, another chart. I gave you the quote. You got to tell me why is it important, okay? Conflicting emotions cross Thrush's face. Oh, we haven't got there yet. I'll be there soon. Let's get back to reading, shall we? I've seen a few signs of game around, but I don't feel comfortable letting Peter alone while I hunt. So I rig half a dozen snares and hope to get lucky. I wonder about the other tributes, how they're managing now that their main source of food has been blown up. At least three of them, Cato, Clove, and Foxface, had been relying on it. Probably not Thrush, though. I've got a feeling you must share some of Rue's knowledge about how to feed yourself from the earth. Are they fighting each other, looking for us? Maybe one of them has located us and is now waiting for the right moment to attack. The idea sends me back to the cave. Peter stretched down on top of the sleeping bag in the shade of the rocks. Although he brightens a bit when I come in, it's clear he feels miserable. I put cool cloths on his head, but the, they warm up almost as soon as they touch his skin. Do you want anything, I ask? No, thank you. Wait, yes. Tell me a story. Now, this is really very much what happens when Rue's dying. She asks her to sing to her. They want some sort of comfort that they know from home. A story about what, I say. I'm not much of a st for storytelling. It's kind of like singing, but once in a while, Prim wheedles one out of me. Something happy. Tell me about the happiest day you can remember, says Peta. Something between a sigh and a huff of exasperation leaves my mouth. A happy story? This will require a lot more effort than the soup. I rack my brains for good memories. Most of them involve Gale and, to, and me hunting, and somehow I don't think these play well with either Peta or the audience. That leaves, that leaves Prim. Did I ever tell you about how I got Prim's goat? I asked. Peter shakes his head and looks at me expectantly, so I begin, but carefully, because my words are going to go out all over Panem. And while people have no doubt put da two and two together that I hunt illegally, I don't want to hurt Gale or Greasy Say or the butcher or even the peacekeepers back home that are my customers, my, public my publicity, by publicly announcing they're breaking the law too. Here's the real story of how I got the money for Prim's goat lady. It was a Friday evening, the day before Prim's 10th birthday in the late May. As soon as the school ended, Gail and I hit the woods because I wanted to get enough trade for the present from Prim. Maybe some new cloth for a dress or a hairbrush. Our snares uh, had done well enough, and the woods were 
flush with greens, but this was really no more than our average Friday night haul. I was disappointed as we headed back, even though Gail said we were sure to be, do better tomorrow. We were resting a moment by the stream when I saw him, a young buck, probably a yearling by his size. His antlers were just growing in, still small and located and coated in velvet. Poised to run, but unsure of us, unfamiliar with humans, beautiful. Less beautiful, perhaps, when the two arrows caught him, one in the neck and the other in the chest. Gale had shot at the same time. The buck tried to run, but stumbled. Gale's knife slit his throat before we knew what he had knew what happened. Momentarily, I felt a pang at killing something so fresh and innocent, and then my stomach rumbled as the, the thought of all that fresh, innocent meat. A deer. Gale and I have only brought down three in all. Three in all. The first one, a doe, had an injured her leg somehow, almost didn't count. But we knew from the experience not to go dragging the carcass into the hob. It was chaos with people bidding on the parts and actually trying to hack off pieces themselves. Greasy Say had intervened and set us to our, with our deer to the butcher. But not before it had been badly damaged, hunks of meat taken, and the, the hide riddled with holes. Although everybody paid up fairly, it had lowered the value of the kill. This time we waited until dark fell and then slipped under the hole in the fence close to the butcher. Even though we had, were known hunters, it, would have been good, it, would have, it wouldn't have been good to go carrying a 150-pound deer through the streets of District 12 in daylight like we were rubbing it in the officials' faces. The butcher, a short, chunky woman named Ruba, came ba to the back door when we knocked. You couldn't haggle with Ruba. She gives you one price, which you can take or leave, but it's a fair price. We took her offer on the deer, and she threw a couple of venison steaks we could pick up after the butchering. Even with the money divided in two, neither Gail nor I had held so much at one time in our lives. We decided to keep a secret and surprise our families with the meat and money at the end of the next day. This is where I really got the money for the goat. But I tell Pete I sold an old silver locket of my mother's. That did, that can't hurt, or can't hurt anyone. When I pick up the story in the late afternoon of Prim's birthday, Gail and I went to the market on the square so that I could buy a dress materials. As I was running my fingers through a length of blue silk, sorry, blue cotton cloth, something caught my eye. There was an old man who keeps a small herd of goats on the other side of the seam. I didn't know his real name. Everyone just calls him Goat Man. His joints were swollen and twisted in painful angles, and he got a hacking cough that proves that he spent years in the mines. But he's lucky. Somewhere along the way, he saved up enough for these goats. Now he has something to do in his old age besides slowly starve to death. He's filthy and impatient, but the goats are clean and their milk is rich if you can afford it. One of the goats, white one with black patches, was lying down in a cart. It was easy to see why. Something probably a dog had mauled the shoulder and infection had set in. It was bad. And Goatman had ho had to hold her up to milk her. But I thought I knew someone who could fix it. Gail, I whispered, I want that goat for Prim. Owning, my, owning a nanny goat can change a life in District 12. The animals can live off almost anything, and the meadow's a perfect feeding place. And they can give four quarts of milk a day to drink, to make into cheese, to sell. It's not even against the law. She's hurt pretty bad, says Gail. We better take a closer look. We went over and brought a cup of milk to share, and then stood over by the goat if, as if idly curious. Let her be, said the man. Just looking, said Gail. Well, look fast. She goes to the butcher soon. Hardly anyone will buy our milk, and when they only pay half price, said the man. What's the butcher giving for her, I asked. The man shrugged. Hang around and see. I turned and saw Rub Ruba coming in across the square towards us. Lucky thing you showed up, said the goat man. Girl's got her eye on the goat. Not if she's spoken for, I said carelessly. Ruba looked up at me and down, and then frowned at the goat. She's not. Look at that shoulder. Bet you have the carcass will be too rotten for even for sausage. What? said the goat man. We had a deal. We had a deal for an animal with a few teeth marks. Not that thing. So to the girl she's stupid enough to take her. And Ruba, <laughs> said Ruba, as she marched off, I caught her wink. The goat man was mad, but he still wanted to go the goat off his hands. It took us half an hour to agree to a price. Quite the crowd had gathered by then, and the hand tanned out opinions. It was an excellent deal if the goat lived, if I'd been robbed if she died. People took sides in the argument, but I took the goat. Gail offered to carry her. I think he wanted to see the look on Prim's face as much as I did. In a moment of complete giddiness, I bought a pink ribbon and tied it around her neck, and then hurried back to my house. You could have seen Prim's reaction when we walked in with that goat. Remember, this is a girl who wept to save that awful old cat buttercup. She was so excited she started crying and laughing all at once. My mother was less sure, seeing the injury, but the pair of them went to work with grinding up herbs and coaxing brews down the animal's throat. They sound like you, says Peta. Says Peta, I'd almost forgotten he was there. Oh no, Peta, they work magic. That thing could have died if I that couldn't think that thing couldn't have died if it tried, I say. But then I bite my tongue, realizing that that must sound like Peta.
who is dying in my incompetent hands. Don't worry, I'm trying, he jokes. Finish the, uh, finish the story. Well, that's it. Only remember that night, Prim insisted on sleeping with Lady in a blanket next to the fire. And just before they drifted off, the goat licked her cheek like it was giving her a goodnight kiss or something, I say. It was already mad about her. Was it still wearing the pink ribbon, he says? I think so, I say. Why? I'm just trying to get a picture, he said thoughtfully. I can see why the day made you happy. Well, I knew that goat would be a gold mine, I say. Yes, of course, I was referring to that. Not the lasting joy you gave your sister, or you loved so much that it took her place in the reaping, says Peter dryly. The goat was paid for itself several times over, I say in a superior tone. Well, it wouldn't dare do anything else after you saved its life, said Peter. I intend to do the same thing. Really? What did you cost me again? A lot of trouble. Don't worry. You'll get it all back, he says. You're not making sense, I say. I test his forehead. The fever is, gone, now, is going now nowhere but up. You're a little cooler, though. The sound of the tri trumpet startles me. I'm on my feet and at the mouth of the cave in a flash. Not wanting to miss a syllable. It's my new best friend, Claudius Templesmith. And as I expected, he's inviting us to a feast. Well, we're not that hungry. And I actually wave his offer away in indifference when he says, Now hold on. Some of you may already be declining my invitation. But this is no ordinary feast. Each of you needs something desperately. I do need something desperately, something to heal Peter's leg. Each of you will find something in a backpack marked with your district number in the cornucopia at dawn. Think hard about refusing to show up. For some of you, this will be your last chance, says Claudius. There's nothing else. Just his words hanging into the air, I jump as Peter gri grips my shoulder from behind. No, he says. You are not risking your life for me. Who said I was, I say. So you're not going, he says. Of course I'm not going. <laughs> Give me some credit. Do you think I'm going to run straight into a free-for-all against Cato and Cloven Thresh? Don't be stupid. I say, helping him, helping him back to the bed. I'll let them fight it out. We'll see who's in the sky tomorrow night. And work out a plan from there. You are such a bad liar, Katniss. I don't know how you survived this long. He begins to mimic me. I knew that girl would be a little gold mine. You're a little cooler, though. Of course, of course I'm not going. He shakes his head. Never gamble at cards. You'll lose your last coin, he says. Anger flushes my face. All right, I'm going, and you can't stop me. I can follow you, at least part way. I might not make it to the cornucopia, but I'll be yelling your name. I bet someone can find me, and then I'll be dead for sure, he says. You won't get a hundred yards from here on that leg, I say. Then I'll drag myself, says Peta. You go, and I'm going, too. He's just stubborn enough to maybe just strong enough to do it. He's come howling after me into the woods. Even if a tribute doesn't find him, something else might. He can't defend himself, and I'll probably have a wall to have to wall him up in the cave just to go myself. And who knows what the exertion will do to him. What am I supposed to do? Sit here and watch you die? I say. He must know that's not an option, that the audience would hate me, and frankly, I would hate myself too if I didn't even try. I won't die, I promise, if you promise not to go, he says. We're at something of a stalemate. I know I can't argue with him out of this one, so I don't try. I pretend reluctantly to go along. Then you have to do what I say and drink the water and wake up when I tell and wake me when you, I tell you to, and eat every drop of this soup no matter how disgusting it is, I snap at him. Agreed. Is it ready? Wait here, I say. The air has gone cold, even though the sun's still up. I'm right about the game makers messing with the temperature. I wonder if the, th of the thing someone needs desperately is a good blanket. The soup is still nice and warm in its iron pot, and actually it doesn't taste too bad. Peta eats without complaint, even scra scraping into the pot to show his enthusiasm. He rambles on about how delicious it is, which should be encouraging if you didn't know what a fever does to people. He's like listening to Hamish before the alcohol has soaked into his incoherence, soaked him into incoherence. I give him another dose of fever medicine before he goes off his head completely. As I go down to the stream to wash up, all I can think is that I'm, he's going to die if I don't get him to the feast. I'll keep if I don't get to the feast. I'll keep him. I'll keep him going for another day or two, and then the infection will reach his heart and brain and his lungs, and he'll be gone, and I'll be there all alone again, waiting for the others. I'm so lost in thought that I almost miss the parachute, even though it floats right by me. When I spring after it, yanking it from the water, tearing off the silver fabric to retrieve the vial. Hamish has done it. He's gotten me the medicine. I don't know how. Persuaded some gaggle of romantic fools to sell their jewels. And I can save Peta. 
It's such a tiny vial, though. It must be very strong to cure someone as ill as Peta. A ripple of doubt runs through me, and I uncork the vial and take a deep sniff. My spirits fall of the sickly sweet scent. Just to be sure, I place a drop at the tip of my tongue, and there's no question. It's sleep syrup. A common medicine in District 12, cheap as medicine goes, but very addictive. Almost everyone's had a dose at one time or another. We have some in the bottle at home. My mother gives it to hysterical patients to knock them out, stitch them up a bad wound, or quiet their minds, or just to help someone in pain get through the night. It only takes a little. A vial this size could knock Peta out for a full day. But what good is that? I'm so furious that I about, I'm about to throw Hamish's last offering into the stream when it hits me. A full day. That's more than I need. I mash up a handful of berries so the taste won't be noticeable, and add some mint leaves for good net measure. Then I head back to the cave. I brought you a treat. I found a new patch of berries a little farther downstream. Peta opens his mouth for the first bite without hesitation. He swallows them and frowns slightly. They're very sweet. Yes, they're sugar berries. My mom makes jam from them. Haven't you ever had them before? I say, poking the next spoonful into his mouth. No, he says, almost puzzled. But they taste familiar. Sugar berries? Well, you can't get them in the market much. They only grow in the wild, I say. Another mouthful goes down. Just one more to go. This sweet is syrup, he says, taking the last spoonful of syrup. His eyes widen as he realizes the truth. I clamp my mouth, uh, my hand over his mouth and nose hard, forcing him to swallow instead of spit. He tries to, to make himself vomit the stuff up, but it's too late. He's already losing consciousness. Even as he fades away, I can see that in his eyes, what I've done is unforgivable. I sit back in my heels and look at him with a mixture of sadness and satisfaction. A stray berry stains his chin and I wipe it away. Who can't lie, Peta? I say, even though he can't hear me. It doesn't matter. The rest of Pan Am can. Chapter 21 In the remaining hours before nightfall, I gather rocks and do my best to camouflage the opening of the cave. It's a slow and arduous process, but after a lot of sweating and shifting things around, I'm pretty pleased with my work. The cave now appears to be part of a larger pile of rocks, like so many in the vicinity. I can still crawl in to PETA all through a small opening, but it's undetectable from the outside. That's good, because I need to share the sleeping bag again tonight. Also, if I don't make it back from the feast, Peter will be hidden, but not entirely imprisoned. Although I doubt he can hang on much longer without the medicine. If I die at the feast, District 12 is likely to have a victor. I make a meal out of the small, bonier fish that inhabit the stream down the here. Fill every water container to purify it and clean my weapons. I have nine arrows left in all, and I debate leaving the knife with Peter so he would have some protection while I'm gone. But there's really no point. He was right about camouflage being a fatal his final defense, but I still might have to use the knife. Who knows what I'll encounter? Here are some things I can fairly certain of, that at least Cato, Clove, and Thresh will be on hand when the feast starts. I'm not so sure about Foxface, since she's the direct confrontation isn't her style or forte. She's even smaller than I am and unarmed, unless she picked up some weapons recently. She'll probably be hanging somewhere nearby, seeing that she can what she can scavenge. But the other three, I'm going to have to have my hands full. My ability to kill at a distance is my greatest asset, but I know I'll have to go right into the thick of things to get the backpack, and one with number 12 on it is Claudia Sepplesmith mentioned. I have watched the sky, hoping for less, op one less opponent at dawn, but nobody appears tonight. Tomorrow there will be, face the there will be faces up there. Feasts always result in fatalities. I crawl, into the ca I crawl into the cave, secure my glasses, and curl up next to Peta. Luckily, I had a good long sleep today. I have to stay awake. I don't really think anyone will attack their cave tonight, <coughs> but I can't risk missing the dawn. So cold, so bitterly cold tonight, as if the game makers had sent the infusion of frozen air across the arena, which may be exactly what they've done. I lay next to Peta in the bag, trying to absorb every bit of this fever heat. It's strange to be so physically close to someone who's so distant. Peta might as well be back in the capital or District 12, or on the moon right now. He'd be no harder to reach. I've never felt so lon I've never felt lonelier so since the games began. Just accept it. it. Will be bad tonight, I tell myself. I try not to, but I can't help thinking of my mother and Prim, wondering if they'll sleep a wink tonight. At this late stage in the games, with the important event like the feast, the school will probably be canceled. My family can either watch from the static-filled old clunker in our television at home, or join the crowds in the square to watch on the big clear screens. They'll have privacy at home, but support in the square. People will give them a kind word, a bit of food if they can spare it. I wonder if the baker has sought them out, especially now that Pete and I are a team, and made good his promise on keeping my sister's belly full. Spirits must be running high in District 12. 
We so rarely have anyone to root for at this point of the game. Surely people are excited about Pete and me, especially now that we're together. If I close my eyes, I can imagine their shouts at the screens urging us on. I see their faces, Gracie Say and Madge, and even the peacekeepers who buy, meat for, 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 uh, who buy my meat, cheering for us. And Gale, I know him. He won't be shouting and cheering, but he'll be watching every moment, every twist, every turn, willing me to come home. I wonder if he's hoping that Peter makes it as well. Gail's not my boyfriend, but it would be, he would be, if I opened that door. But would he be if I opened that door? He talked about us running away together. Was that just a practical calculation of our chances of survival away from the district, or something more? I wonder what he, ma he makes of all this kissing. Through the crack in the rocks, I watched the moon cross the sky, and at the and what I judged to be a about three hours before dawn, I begin final preparations. I'm careful to leave Peter with water and the medical kit right beside him. Nothing else will be of much use if I don't return, and even these would only prolong his life a short time. After some debate, I strip him of his jacket and zip it on over my own. He doesn't need it, not now in the sleeping bag with his fever. And during the, de and during the day, if I'm not here to remove it, he'll be roasting in it. My hands are already stiff from cold, so I take Ruth's spare pair of socks, cut holes for my fingers and thumbs, and pull them on. It helps anyway. I fill her small pack with some food, a water bottle, and bandages, tuck the knife into my belt to get my bow and arrows. I'm about to leave when I remember the importance of sustaining a star-crossed lover routine. I lean over and give Peter a long, lingering kiss. I imagine the teary sighs emanating from the capital and pretend to brush away a tear of my own. Then I squeeze through the opening in the rocks out into the night. My breath makes a small white cloud as it hits the air. It's cold as November night at home. One where I've slipped into the woods, lantern in hand, to join Gail at some prearranged place where we'll sit bundled together, sipping herb tea from metal flasks wrapped in quilting, hope, hoping game will pass our way as the morning comes on. Oh, Gail, I think, if only you had my back now. I move as fast as I dare. The glasses are quite remarkable, but I still sorely miss having the use of my left ear. I don't know what the explosion did, but it damaged something deep and in irreparable. Never mind. If I get home, I'll be stinking rich. I'll be able to have someone to do my hearing. The woods always look different at night, even with the glasses. Everything has an unfamiliar slant to it, as if the daytime trees and flowers and stones had gone to bed and sent slightly more ominous versions of themselves to take their place. I don't try anything tricky, like taking any route. I make my way back up the stream and follow the same path back to Rue's hiding place near the lake. Along the way, I see no sign of another tribute, not a puff of a breath, not a quiver of a branch. Either I'm the first to arrive or the others have positioned themselves last night. There is still more than an hour, maybe two, when I wiggle into the underbrush and wait for the blood to begin to flow. I chew a few mint leaves. My stomach isn't up for much more. Thank goodness. I have Peter's jacket as well as my own. If not, I'll be forced to move around and stay warm. The sky turns a misty morning gray, and there's still no sign of the other tributes. It's not surprising, really. Everyone ha has distinguished themselves either by strength or deadliness and cunning. So they suppose I wonder what I have Peter with me. I doubt Foxface or Thresh even know he's wounded. All the better if they think he's covering for me when I get go in for the backpack. But where is it? The arena has lightened enough for me to remove my glasses. I can hear the morning birds singing. Isn't it time? For a second, I'm panicked that I'm, that I'm at the wrong location. But no, I'm certain I remember Claudia Templeman specifically saying the cornucopia. And here, there it is. And here I am. So where is my feast? Just as the first day's sun glints off the gold cornucopia, there's a disturbance in the plain. The ground before the mouth of the horn splits in two, and a round table with an ivory white cloth rises into the arena. On the table sits four backpacks, Two large backpacks with the numbers 2 and 11, a medium-sized green one with number 5, and a tiny orange one. Really, I could carry it around my wrist. This is, must be marked 12. The table is just clicked into place when a figure darts out of the cornucopia, snags the green backpack, and speeds off. Fox face! Leave it to her to come up with such a clever, risky idea. The rest of us are still poised around the plane, sizing up the situation. She got hers. She got us trapped, too, because no one wants to chase her down. Not while their own pack sits in a, so vulnerable on the table. Foxface must be purposefully left her, her, her the other packs alone, knowing that to steal one without her number would definitely bring in the pursuer. That should have been my strategy. By the time I've worked through the emotions of surprise, admiration, anger, jealousy, and frustration, I'm watching the reddish mane of her hair disappear into the trees, well out of shooting range. Huh! I'm always dreading the others, but maybe Foxface is the real opponent here. She cost me time, too, because they now it's now clear that I must get to the table next. Anyone who beats me for it will easily scoop up my pack and be gone. 
Without hesitation, I sprint for the table. I can sense the emergence of danger before I see it. Fortunately, the first knife comes whizzing into my right side so I can hear it, and I'm able to deflect it with my bow. I turn, drawing back the bowstring to send an arrow straight into Clove's heart. She turns just enough to avoid the fatal hit, but the point punctures her upper left arm. Unfortunately, she throws with her right, but it's enough to slow her down for a few moments, having to pull the arrow from her arm, taken in severity of the wound, and keep moving, positioning the next arrow automatically I only, as only someone who has hunted for years can do. I'm at the table tonight now, my fingers closing over the tiny orange backpack. My hand slips between the straps and yank it onto my arm. It's really too small to fit on any other part of my anatomy, and I'm turning to fire again when the second knife catches me in the forehead. It slices above my right eyebrow, opening a gash, and sends a ga the gush running down my face, blinding my eye, filling my mouth with the sharp metallic taste of my own blood. I stagger backward, but still manage to send my readied arrow into the general direction of my assailant. I know as it leaves my hands it will miss. And then Clove slams into me, knocking me flat on my back, pinning my shoulders to the ground with her knees. This is it, I think. And hope for Prim's prim sake it will be fast. But Clove means to savor the moment. Even, even feels she has time, no doubt. Cato is somewhere nearby, guarding her, waiting for Thresh, possibly Peta. Where's your boyfriend, District 12? Still hanging on? She asks. Well, as long as you're talking, we're talking, I'm alive. He's out there now, hunting Cato, I snarl at her. Then I scream at the top of my lungs, Peta! Clove jams her, first, her fist into my windpipe, very efficiently cutting off my voice, but her head whipping from side to side, and I know for a moment she's at least considering I'm telling the truth. Since no Peta appears to save me, she turns back to me, liar, she says with a grin. He's nearly dead. Cato knows where to cut him. You probably got him strapped up somewhere in a tree while you try to keep his heart going. What's in the pretty little backpack? That medicine for lover boy? Too bad he'll never get it. Clove opens her jacket. It's lined with an impressive array of knives. She carefully selects an almost dainty looking number with a cruel curved blade. I promised Cato if, if he let me have you, I'd give an audience a good show. I'm struggling now in an effort to unseat her, but it's no use. She's too heavy and her, and her lock on me is too, not, is too tight. Forget it, District 12. We're going to kill you. Just like we did your pathetic little ally. What was her name? The one who hopped around in the trees. Rue? Well, first Rue, then you. And then I think we'll just na let nature take its care, care of God, lover boy. How does that sound? Chloe says. Now where to start? She carelessly wipes away the blood from the wound under her jacket sleeve. And for a moment she surveys my face, tilting it from side to side as if a block of wood she's deciding exactly what pattern to carve into it. I attempt to bite her hand, but she grabs the hair at the top of my head, forces me back to the ground. I think, she almost purrs, I think we'll start with your mouth. I clamp my teeth together as she teasingly traces the outline of my lips with the tip of her blade. I won't close my eyes. The comment about Rue has filled me with fury. Enough fury, I think, to die with some dignity. As my last act of defiance, I will stare her down as long as I, as long as can, I can see, which will probably not be an extended period of time. But I will stare her down. I will not cry out. I will not die in my small way undefeated. Sorry, I will die in my own small way, undefeated. Yes, I don't think you'll have much use of your lips anymore. Want to blow clever boy one last kiss, she asks. I work up a mouthful of blood and saliva and spit into her face. She flushes with rage. All right, then, let's get started. I brace myself for agony that's sure to follow. But as I feel the tip open the first cut in at my lip, some great form yanks clove from my body, and then she's screaming. I'm too stunned at first, to, uh, too unable to process what's happened. Has Pete has somehow come to my rescue? Have the game makers sent some wild animal to aid into the, add into the fun? Has a hovercraft inexplicably plucked her into the air? But when I push myself into my numb arms, I see it's done all of the above. Clove is dangling a foot off the ground, imprisoned in Thresh's arms. I let out a gasp, seeing him like that, towering over me, holding Clove like a rag doll. I remember he, he was him big. But he seems massive, more powerful than I even recall. If anything, he seems to have gained weight in the arena. He flips Clove around and flings her into the ground. Then he shouts. I jump, never having heard him speak even above a mutter. What'd you do to that little girl? You kill her? Clove is scrambling backward, all fours like a frantic insect. Too shocked to even call for Cato. No, 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 it wasn't me. You said her name. I heard you. You kill her? Another thought brings a fresh wave of rage into his features. You cut her up like you're going to cut up this girl here? No, no. I, Clove sees the stone about the size of a small loaf of bread in Thresh's hand and loses it. Kato! She screeches, Kato! 
Clove? I hear Cato's answer, but he's too far all away. I can tell that much, and too good to do her any good. What was he doing, trying to get Foxface or Peta? Or had he been lying in wait for Thresh and just badly misjudged his location? Thresh brings the rock down hard against Clove's temple. It's not, it's not bleeding, but I can see the dent in her skull, and I know that she's a goner. There's still life in her now, though. With rapid rays and fall of her chest, the low moan escapes her lips. When Fresh whirls round to me, the rock is raised, and I know it's no good to run. And my bow is empty, and the last loaded arrow having gone to Clove's direction. I'm trapped with the glare of his strange golden brown eyes. What's she mean about Rue being your ally? I, I, we teamed up, blew up the supplies. I tried to save her. I did. But he got there first, District 1, I say. Maybe if he knows that I helped Rue, he won't choose some slow, sadistic way to end me. Did you kill him, he demands. Yes, I killed him. I buried her in flowers, I say. I sang her to sleep. Tears spring into my eyes. The tension of the fight goes out of me in that memory. And I am overwhelmed by Rue and the pain in her head, in my head. And my fear of Thresh and the moaning of the dying girl a few feet away. To sleep, he says gruffly. To death. I sang until she died, I say. Your district? They sent me bread. My hand reaches up, reaches up, but not for an arrow. That I know I've never, I could never reach, just to wipe my nose. Do it fast, okay? Thresh. Conflicting emotions cross Thresh's face. He lowers the rock and points at me, almost accusingly. Just this one time, I let you go. For the little girl. You and me, we're even now. No more owed. You understand? I nod, because I do understand. Okay, we're going to stop and go back to our work real quick. Now, if we go right over here, we have the significance. Conflicting emotions thr cross Thresh's face. She lowers the rock and points at me, almost accusingly. Just this one time, I let you go for the little girl. You and me were even then. No more owed. You understand? Oh, my God. This is so significant. Okay. One, we see a parallel between Thresh and Katniss because he doesn't like owing people and she doesn't like owing people. So, number one, we've got it. Wait one second, I gotta pause because I got an email. So sorry, guys. So we got that parallel between Thresh and Katniss. Then we have on top of that, we've got the entire idea that Rue's um, alliance with Katniss is still paying off. Even though Rue is dead, that memory of her keeps Katniss alive. Number three, we know that Kato's not there, which means she's gonna be able to grab that and run. And she has literally added to her story. Because now, not only is she Peta's love interest, not only is she the savior of Rue, but we also know that Thresh and her, for five milliseconds, have an alliance enough that he is not going to bash her head in with a rock. So this is a hugely significant moment because it solidifies the friendship between District 11 and District 12. And that friendship is going to change their entire world. But let us go in. Oh, got to read the next paragraph. Sorry, my bad. I nod because I understand about owing, about hating it. And I understand that if Fresh Thresh wins, he'll have to go back and face the district that has already broken all the rules to thank me. And he is breaking the rules to thank me too. And I understand that for that moment, Thresh is not going to smash my skull. Clove! Kate's voice is much nearer now. And I can tell by the pain in it that he sees her on the ground. Better run now, fire girl says Thresh. I don't have to be told twice. Oh, awesome. Now, again, we talked about that. This is the solidification between District 11 and District 12. It's a huge deal because, again, Thresh is breaking every rule to allow her to live. And this is a huge deal because it's going to ramp up the us versus them mentality of the games. Because currently, right now, except for Voxface, we've got District 2, you know, the hierarchy where everybody loves, you know, District 1 and District 2, because they're the closest to the capital against District 11 and 12, who are the underdogs. And the underdogs actually are ganging up together. And that's a big deal. Now, on top of that, we have, again, this parallel between Thrush and Katniss. We see, and the audience sees, that these two people from two districts, one male, one female, one black, one white, they are still the same people. They still hold the same values. And that is what's going to bring those two districts together and start a revolution. Now, let us continue. Boom.
I didn't need to be told twice. I flip over and to my feet, dip into the hard-packed earth, and run away from Thresh and Clove and the sound of Kato's voice. Only when I reach the woods do I turn back for an instant. Thresh has both the large backpacks and are varnish is vanishing into the edge of the plain, into an area I've never seen. Kato kneels, kneels b b beside Clove, spear in hand, begging her to stay with him. In a moment, he will realize it's futile. She can't be saved. I crash into the trees, repeatedly swiping away the blood that's pouring from my eye, fleeing like a wild, wounded creature that I am. After a few minutes, I hear a cannon, and I know that Clove has died, that Cato will be on one of our trails, either Thresh's or mine. I seized with, I'm seized with terror, weak from my head wound, shaking. By the way, head wounds bleed like crazy. I load an arrow, but Cato can throw a spear almost as far as I can shoot. Only one thing claims calms me. Thresh has Cato's backpack, containing the thing he needs desperately. If I had to bet, Cato headed out for after Thresh, not me. Still, I don't slow down until I reach the water. I plunge right in, boots still on, and flounder upstream. I keep off Rue's so I pull off Rue's socks that have been using as gloves and press them to my forehead, trying to staunch the flow of blood. But they're soaked in minutes. Somehow I make it back to the cave. I squeeze through the rocks into the dappled light. I pull the little orange backpack from my arm, cut it open, open the clasp, and dump the contents on the ground. One slim box containing one hypodermic needle. Without hesitating, I jam the needle into Peta's arm and slowly press down the plunger. My hands go to my head, then I drop in my lap, slick with blood. The last thing I remember is an exquisitely beautiful green and silver moth landing on the curve of my wrist. Let's go over to week. Ah, the last thing I remember is an exquisitely silver moth and green mouth landing on the curve of my wrist. Okay, A. One, this is a, something of beauty and all this grisly, horrible things. So that parallels Rue, who's something that's absolutely beautiful and wonderful inside and out. That was in this horrible, bloody mess. But we also have the fact that she's passed out cold. So is she going to live or is she going to bleed to death? Thing is, is that with head wounds, because your head is a sphere and skin is just a plane, what ends up happening is when you cut it, the natural gravity actually pulls the incision apart. That's the reason why most head wounds have to be stitched or glued together, even stapled together, in order to keep them from continuously bleeding. So this is kind of worrisome because she has treated PETA. But it's not a, um, it's not something that you drink or something that you rub on like in the movie. It's a hypodermic needle that they cannot use on her, which is what they do so that they can cover up the fact that the, you know, actress was going to have to have a big, bloody, nasty wound. Now, oh, here we go. This is chapter 22. Ready, guys? Now. Essential question. How can people change perceptions in order to win? Is the relationship between Katniss and Peeta made up for TV cameras or is it real? Find evidence in the next to support your answer. On the right side of this page, fill in the chart with your position. Textual evidence and support. Now, my position. I think that the relationship between Katniss or Peeta is, and then you have to say real or for the cameras. Okay, that's the first thing. Then you have to go over here. You have to find it. I'm going to ask for three minimum. Three minimum. I'll give you a C for that. I'll give you a five as an A. Okay. Three C, four B, five A. And how it supports my position. Now, here's the big deal. You have to have page numbers. You can't sit here and be like, I'm in the I don't want to. No, you got to have page numbers. And then over here, you got to tell me why this supports your position. Okay. So first things first, I would go back in time to the chapter before and Katniss goes to save PETA. Okay. You can use that one as your first one. Give me a page number and why it supports your position. She could easily let him die and not put herself in, in harm's way and lived. Now I'm going to say, Hey, that might be a quote every time we run into a quote, but I will not be coming back from the, to this page. Chapter 22. The sound of rain drumming on the roof of our house gently pulls me towards consciousness. I fight to return to sleep, though, wrapped in my warm cocoon of blankets, safe at home. I'm vaguely aware that my head aches. Possibly I have the flu, and this is why I'm allowed to stay in bed, even though I can still tell I've been sleeping a long time. My mother's hand strokes my cheek, and I don't push it away, as would I would in wakefulness, never wanting her to know how much I crave that gentle touch, how much I miss her, even though I still don't trust her. Then there's a voice, the wrong voice, not my mother's, and I'm scared. Katniss, it says. Katniss, can you hear me? 
My eyes open and the sense of security vanishes. I'm not at home, not with my mother. I'm in a dim, chilly cave, my bare feet freezing despite the cover. They are tainted with the unmistakable smell of blood. The haggard, pale voice, face of a boy slides into view, and after an initial jolt of alarm, I feel better. Peta? Hey, he says. Good to see you again. How long have you been out? I ask. Not sure. I woke up yesterday evening, and you were lying next to me in a very scary pool of blood, he says. I think it stopped finally, but it wouldn't. I wouldn't sit up or anything. I gingerly lift my head, hand to my head and find it bandaged. The simple gesture leaves me weak and dizzy. Peta holds a bottle to my lips, and I drink thirstily. You're better, I say. Much better. Whatever you shot into my arm did the trick. By this morning, almost all the swelling in my leg is gone. He doesn't seem angry about my tricking him drugging him and running off to the feast. Maybe I'm just too beat up, and I'll hear about it later when I'm stronger. But for the moment, he's all gentleness. Did you eat, I ask? I'm sorry to say I gobbled down three pieces of goosling before I realized it might have to last a while. Don't worry, I'm back on a strict diet, he says. No, it's good. You, you need to eat. I'll be hunting soon, I say. Not too soon, right? He says, you just let me take care of you a while. Okay, so the fact that he wants to take care of her, even though there's really nothing in it for him, that's a really good one to use for. It is real. I don't really seem to have much choice. Peter needs me to feeds me bites of grusling and raisins and makes me drink plenty of water. He rubs some warmth back into my feet and wraps me in his jacket before tucking the sleeping bag back around my chin. Your boots and socks are still damp, and the weather's not helping much, he says. There's a clap of thunder, and I see lightning electrify the sky through the, an opening in the rocks. Rain drips through several holes in the ceiling, but Peta has built a sort of canopy over my head and upper part of my body by wedging a square of plastic into the rock above me. I wonder what brought on the storm. I mean, who's the target, says Peta. Cato and Thresh, I say without thinking. Fox's face will be in her den somewhere, and Clove, she cut me, and then my voice trails off. I know Clove's dead. I saw it in the, night, in the sky last night, he said. Did you kill her? No. Thresh broke her skull with a rock, I say. Lucky he didn't catch you too, says Peta. The memory of the feast turns in full force and I feel sick. He did, but he let me go. And then, of course, I have to tell him about things I've kept to myself because he was too sick to ask and wasn't ready to relive anyway, like the explosion in my ear and Rue's dying and the boy from District 1 and the bread. All I know, all of which leads to what happened with Thresh and how he's paying off a debt of sorts. He let you go because he didn't want to owe you anything? Peta says in disbelief. Yes, I don't expect you to understand. You've always had enough. But if you've lived in the seam, I wouldn't have to explain it, I say. And don't try. Obviously, I'm too dim to get it. It's like the bread. How I never seem to get over owing you for that, I say. The bread what? From when we were kids? I think we can let that go. I mean, you just brought me back from the dead. But you didn't know me. we never spoken. Besides, it's the first gift that's always the hardest to pay back. I wouldn't even have to been there if it would have been here. To do it if you hadn't helped me, I say. Why did you anyway? Why? You know why, says Peter says, and I give my head a slight heart, heart painful shake. Hamish said you wouldn't. You would take a lot of convincing. Hamish? I ask. What's he got to do with it? Nothing, Sophia says. So Cato and Thresh, huh? I guess it's too... Ah, so we can go back and like their Peter's side of the love is real because that's what he's saying right here. Hamish said you would take a lot of convincing. Why you know why? Because Peter loves her. That's the reason why he saves her. He loves her. Hamish said you would take a lot of convincing. Hamish told him she's not going to believe you that you love her. Mm-mm. Girl got trust issues. So we can use that one as an example of, yeah, that's the reason why. That their love is real. Nothing, Peter says. So Cato and Thresh, huh? I guess it's too much to hope that we'll simultaneously destroy each other. But the thought only upsets me. I think we would like Thresh. I think he'd be our friend back in District 12, I say. Ooh, that's poignant. Not for our chart, but that's really important. Because she's showing that you know what? The district could get along if, we, like, the capital didn't interfere. Then let's hope Cato kills him so we don't have to. I don't want Cato to kill Thresh at all. And I don't want anyone else to die. This is absolutely not the kind of thing the victors go around saying in the arena. 
Despite my best efforts, I can feel tears starting to pool in my eyes. Peter looks at me with concern. What is it? Are you in a lot of pain? I give him another answer because it's equally true, but can be taken as a brief moment of weakness instead of a terminal one. I want to go home, Peter. I say plaintively like a ch little child. You will, I promise, he says, and he bends to give me a kiss. I want to go home now, I say. Tell you what, you go back to sleep and dream of home, and you'll be there for real before you know it, he says. Okay? Okay, I whispered. Wave me if you need me to keep watch. I'm good and rested, thanks to you and Hamish. Besides, who knows how long this will last, he says. What does he mean? The storm? The brief respite for us? The, ga the games themselves? I don't know, but I'm on... But I am sad and tired, too sad and tired to ask. It's evening when Peter wakes me again. The rain has turned into a downpour, sending streams of water through our ceiling where earlier there had only been drips. Peter has placed the broth pot under the worst one and repositions the plastic to deflect most of it from me. I feel a little better and able to sit up without getting too dizzy, and I'm absolutely famished. So is Peter. It's clear that he's been waiting for me to wake up to eat and is eager to get started. There's not much left. Two pieces of grusling, a small mishmash of roots, and a handful of dried fruit. Should we try to ration it? Peter asks. No. Let's just finish it. The grusling's too old anyway, and the last thing we need is to get sick from off-spoilt food. I say, dividing the food into two equal piles. We try and eat slowly, but we're both so hungry we're done in a couple of minutes. My stomach is in no way satisfied. Tomorrow's hunting day, I say. I won't be much help with that, he says. I've never hunted before. I'll kill you and you cook, I said. And you can always gather. I wish there was some sort of bread to bread bush out there. The bread they sent to me from District 11 was still warm, I say with a sigh. Here, chew these. I hand him a couple of mint leaves and prop a few into my own mouth. It's hard to even see the projection in the sky, but it's clear enough to know that there are no more deaths today. So Cato and Thresh haven't had it out yet. Where did Thresh go? I mean... What's on the far side of the circle? I ask Peta. A field. As far as you can see, it's full of grasses and high as my shoulders. I don't know, maybe some sort of some of them are green. There are patches of different colors. But there are no paths, said Peta. I bet some of them are green. I bet Thresh knows which ones are, which ones too. Do you go in there? No. Nobody really wanted to, to track Thresh down in the grass. It has a sinister feeling to it. Every time I look at that field, all I can think of are hidden things. Snakes and rabbit animals and quicksand. Peter says, there could be anything in there. I don't say so, but Peter's words remind me of the warnings they give us to not about, about not going beyond the fence in District 12. I can help for a moment comparing him with Gail, who would see that field as a potential source of food as well as a threat. Thresh certainly did. It's not Pete is soft exactly, and he's provided proof that he's not a coward. But there are things you don't question too much, I guess, when your home always smells like baked bre baking bread, whereas Gail questions everything. What would Peter think of the irreverent banter that passes between us as we break the laws each day? Would it shock him, the things we say about Pan Am? Gail's tirades against the capital? Maybe there is a bread bush in the field, I say. Maybe that's why Thresh looks better fed now than he did at the start of the games. Either that or he's got a very good, as very generous sponsor, says Peta. I wonder what we'd have to do to get Hamish to send us some bread. I raise my eyebrows before I remember he doesn't know about the message Hamish sent a couple of nights ago. One kiss equals one pot of broth. It's not a sort of thing you can blurt out either. To say my thoughts aloud would uh, tripping off the audience that the romance has been fabricated to play their sympathies, and that would be result in no food at all. Okay, so there's a wonderful quote for it's fake. All of this is fake. Somehow, believably, I got, I've got to get things back on track. Something simple to start with. I reach out and take his hand. Well, you probably used a lot of our resources helping me knock you out, I said mischievously. Yeah, about that, says Peta, entwining our fingers in mine. Don't try something like that again. Or what, I asked. Or, or, he can't think of anything good. Just, just give me a minute. What's the problem, I say with a grin. The problem is that you're bo we're both still alive, which only reinforces the idea that in your mind that you did the right thing, says Peta. I did do the right thing, I say. No, just don't, Katniss. He grip, his grip tighten, tightens, hurting my hand. And there's real anger in his vice, voice. Don't die for me. You won't be doing me any favors, all right? Okay, there's a check mark for it's real, at least for PETA. He's like, look, if you die, that'd be just as bad as me dying. I've started by the intensity, but recognize an excellent opportunity for getting food. So I try to keep up. 
Maybe I did it for myself, Peta. Did you ever think of that? Maybe you aren't the only one who, who worries about what it would be like if... And then right here we have her reply is completely fabricated and no joke is evidence that it's not real. I fumble. I'm not as smooth with words as Peta. As Peta. And while I'm talking, the idea of actually losing Peta hit me again, and I realize how much I, won't, I don't want him to die. And it's not about the sponsors, and it's not about what will happen at home. And it's not just that I don't want him to be alone. It's him. I don't want to lose the boy with the bread, okay? And now that's an example of why it is real. If what, Katniss? He says softly. I wish I could pull the shutters closed, blocking out this moment from the prying eyes of Pan Am. Even it means losing food. Whatever I'm feeling, it's no one's business but mine. That's exactly the kind of topic Hamish told me to steer clear of, I say evasively. Although Hamish never said anything of the kind. In fact, he's probably cursing me out right now for dropping the ball during such an emotionally charged moment. But Peter somehow catches it. Then I'll just have to fill in the blanks myself, he says, and moves in to me. This is the first kiss that we've both been fully aware of. Neither of us hob hobbled by sickness or pain or simply unconscious. Our lips neither burning with fever nor icy cold. This is the first kiss where I actually feel a stirring inside my chest. Warm and curious. This is the first kiss that makes me want another. There's an example of why it's real. But I don't get it. Well, I don't get the second kiss. But it's just a light one on the tip of my nose because Pete has been distracted. I think your wound is bleeding again. Come on, lie down. It's bedtime anyway, he says. My socks are dry enough to wear it now, and I make Peta put his jacket back on. The damp cold seems to cut right down to my bones, so he, he must be half frozen. I insist on taking the first watch, too, although neither of us is likely likely anyone will come come in in this bad weather. But he won't agree unless I'm in the bag, too, and I'm shivering so hard that it's pointless to object. In stark contrast to two nights ago when I felt Peter was a million miles away, I'm struck by his intimacy now. As we settle in, he pulls my head down to use his arm as a pillow, and the other rests protectively over me even when he goes to sleep. No one has held me like this in such a long time since my father died, and I've stopped trusting my mother. No one else's arms have ever made me feel this safe. Okay, proof that it's real. With the aid of the glasses, I lie watching the drips of water spatter in the cave floor. Rhythmic lulling, several minutes, several, um, several times I drift off briefly and then snap awake, guilty and angry with myself. After three or four hours, I can't help it. I have to rouse Peta because I can't keep my eyes open. He doesn't seem to mind. Tomorrow when it's dry, I'll find a place that's so high in the trees we can both sleep in peace, I promise, as I drift off. But tomorrow is no better in terms of weather. The deluge, that means a really hard storm, continues as if the game makers are intent on washing us all away. The thunder is so powerful it seems to shake the ground. Peta is considering heading out anyway and scavenging for food but i tell him in the storm it would be pointless he wouldn't be able to see three feet in front of his face and he'll only end up getting soaked to the skin for his troubles he knows i'm right but the gnawing in our stomachs is becoming painful the day drags on turning into evening and there's no break in the weather hamish is our only hope but nothing is forthcoming either from lack of money everything would cost an exorbitant amount or because he's dissatisfied with our performance probably the latter I'd be the first to admit that there's not exactly riveting today, starving, weakness from our energy, injuries, trying not to reopen wounds. We're sitting huddled together, wrapped in a sleeping bag, yes, but mostly to keep warm. And the most exciting thing either of us does is nap. I'm not really sure how to ramp up the romance. The kiss last night was nice, but working up another one will take some foresight. Okay, and here's proof that it's not real. There are girls in the seam, some of the, of the merchant girls too, who navigate to these waters so easily. But I've never seen, had much time for or use for it. Anyway, just a kiss isn't enough anymore. Clearly, because if it was, we'd have gotten fast food last night. My instincts tell me that Hamish isn't just looking for physical affection. He wants something more personal, the sort of stuff he has been trying to get me to tell about myself when we were practicing for the interview. I'm rotten at it, but Peta's not. Maybe the best approach is to get him talking. Peta, I say lightly. You said in the interview that you had a crush on me forever. When did forever start? Oh, let's see. I guess the first day of school? We were five. You had a red plaid, dr plaid dress on and your hair. It was in two braids instead of one. My father pointed at you when we were waiting in line up, to line up, Peter says. Your father? Why? I ask. He said, see that little girl? I wanted to marry her mother, but she ran away with a coal miner. Peter says, what? You're making that up, I exclaimed. Nope, true story, Peter says. And I said, a coal miner? Why did she want a coal miner? She could have had you. And he said, because when he sings, even the birds stop to listen. That's true, they do. I mean, they did, I say. 
I'm stunned and surprisingly moved thinking of the baker telling this to Peta. It strikes me that my own reluctance to sing, my own dismissal of music, might not really be what I think it's a waste of time. It might be because it reminds me too much of my father. So that day in music assembly, the teacher asked who knew the valley song and your hand shot straight up in the air. She stood you up on a stool and had you sing it for us. And I swear every bird outside the windows fell silent. Peter says, oh, please. I say laughing. No, it happened. And right when your song ended, I knew. Just like your mother, I was a goner. Peto says, and then the next 11 years, I tried to work up the nerve to talk to you. Without success, I added, without success. So in a way, my name being drawn in the reaping was a real piece of luck. Okay, so that entire story is a really good example of why it's real. Without success. For a moment, I was almost foolishly happy and the confusion sweeps over me because I'm we're supposed to be making this stuff up, playing at being in love, not actually being in love. But Peter's story has a ring of truth to it and the part about my father and the birds. And I did sing the first day of school, although I don't remember the song and the poet red plaid dress. There was one, a hand-me-down to Prim that got washed to rags after my father's death. It would explain another thing, too. Why Peter took a beating to give me a bread on that awful hollow day. So if these details are true, could it all be true? You have a remarkable memory, I said haltingly. I remember everything about you, says Peta, tucking a loose strand of my hair behind my ear. You're the one who wasn't paying attention. I am now, I say. Well, I don't have much competition here, he says. I want to draw away to close those shutters again, but I know I can't. It has to... It, it, it's as if I can hear Hamish whispering in my ear, say it, say it. There's proof that she's, it's not real because she's actually trying to think all this stuff up. I swallow hard and get my words out. You don't have much competition anywhere. And this time it's me who leans in. Our lips have much, just barely touched when the clunk outside makes us jump. My bow comes up, the arrow ready to fly, but there's no other sound. Pete appears through the rocks and then gives a whoop. Before I can stop him, he's he, he's out in uh, uh, out in the rain, then handling something bet into me, a silver parachute attached to a basket. I rip it open at once, and inside there's a feast: fresh rolls, goat cheese, apples. The best of all, a tureen of that incredible lamb stew on wild rice. The very dish I could hear Caesar Flickerman was the most. Imp I told Caesar, Fli Caesar Flickerman was the most impressive thing the capital had to offer. Peter wriggles back inside. His voice lit up like the sun. I guess Hamish finally got tired of watching him starve. I guess so. I answer, but in my head I can hear Hamish smug as a slightly exasperated words. Yes, that's what I'm. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about, sweetheart. Chapter twenty-three. Okay, so if we go over here, we've already answered this. We've got plenty of here this, but you got to pick one position. Not do one, not do one. Let's go to our next slide, shall we? Another chart? Yes, it's another chart. Read the answer to each question in the chart on the right side. Cite evidence from the text to support your answers and indicate this theme relates to. Here we go. How do Peta and Katniss think Hamish won the games in his year? How, why does Katniss call Thrush's death murder? Why doesn't Katniss want to marry and have children? Why is Peta a terrible hunter? Who killed Foxface and how? Here we go. So we're going to give an answer here, very short. Then we're going to do our evidence. Please feel free to sh make the text smaller. So we're going to copy and paste our evidence where we found it. And then we're going to say which theme it has to deal with. So the first thing we're looking at is how do Peter and Katniss think that, <laughs> that Hamish won his Hunger Games? Every cell in my body wants to dig into that stew and cram it in. Handful by handful into my mouth. But Peter's voice stops me. We better take it slow on the stew. Remember the first night at the train? The rich food made me sick and it wasn't even st I wasn't even starving then. You're right. And I could just inhale the whole thing, I said regretfully. But I don't. We're quite sensible. We each eat half a roll, half an apple, and an egg side serving of the stew and rice. I make myself eat the stew in tiny spoonfuls. They even sent us silverware and plates, savoring each bite. And when we finish, I stare longingly at the dish. I want more. Me too. Tell you what. We sit an hour. If it stays down, we'll have another serving. Agreed, I say. It's going to be, be a long hour. Maybe not that long, says Peta. 
what was you were just saying just before the food arrived? Something about me, no competition, best thing that ever happened to you. I don't remember the last part. Says <laughs> I say, hoping it's too dim in here for the cameras to pick up my blush. Oh, that's right. That's what I was thinking, I say. Screwed over, I'm freezing. I make room for him in the sleeping bag, and we lean back against the cave wall. My head is on his shoulders, my arms wrapped around me. I can feel Hamish nudging me to keep up the act. So, since we were five, you never even noticed other girls, I ask him. No, I noticed just about every girl, but none of them made a lasting impression but you, he says. I'm sure that would thrill your parents, you liking a girl from the seam, I said. Hardly, but I couldn't care less. Anyway, if we make it back, you won't be a girl from the seam. You'll be a girl in Victor's village, he says. That's right, if we win, we'll each get a house in the part of town reserved for Hunger Games victors. Long ago, when the games began, the capital had built a dozen fine houses in each district. Of course, in ours, only one is occupied. Most of the others have never been lived in at all. A disturbing thought hits me. But then, our only neighbor will be Hamish. Ugh, that'll be nice, says Peta, threatening, tightening his arms around me. You and me and Hamish, very cozy. Picnics, birthdays, long winter nights around the fire, retelling old Hunger Games tales. I told you he hates me, I say, but I can't help laughing at the image of Hamish becoming my new pal. Only sometimes when he's sober. <laughs> I've never heard him say a negative thing about you, says Peta. He's never sober, I protest. That's right. Who am I thinking of? Oh, I know. It's Senna who likes you. But that's mainly because you don't try to run when he tries to set you on fire, says Peta. On the other hand, Hamish, well, if I were you, I'd avoid Hamish completely. He hates you. I thought you said I was his favorite, I say. He hates me more, says Kimita. I don't think people in general are his sort of thing. I know the audience will enjoy our having fun at Hamish's expense. He's been around a long time, and he's practically an old friend to some of them. And after his head dive off the stage at the reaping, everybody knows him. By this time, they'll have dragged him out into the control room for interviews about us. Now, no telling what sort of lies he's made up. He's at something of a disadvantage because most of the mentors have a partner, another victor to help them, whereas Hamish is just has to be ready to go in action at any moment. Kind of like me when I was alone in the arena. I wonder how he's holding up with the drinking, the attention, the stress of trying to keep us alive. It's funny, Hamish and I, Hamish and I don't get along well in person, but maybe Peta is right about us being alike because he seems to be able to communicate me with me by the timing of his gifts. Like how I knew just I must be close to water when he withheld it, and how I knew the sleep syrup wasn't something to ease Peta's pain, and how I knew now that I had to play up the romance. He hasn't made much of an effort to connect with Peta, really. Perhaps he thinks a bowl of broth would be just a bowl of broth to Peta, whereas I'll see it as, as, with strings attached to it. The thought hits me, and I'm amazed that the question's taken so long to surface. Maybe it's because I've only recently begun to review Hamish in degree of curiosity. How do you think he did it? Who did what? Peter asks. Hey, Mitch, how do you think you won the games? I say. Peter considers this quite a while before he answers. Hey, Mitch is a steady, sturdy build, but no physical wonder like Cato or Thresh. He's not particularly handsome, not in a way that's you, that causes sponsors to rain gifts down on you. And he's so surly, it's hard to imagine anyone teaming up with him. There's only one way Hamish could have won, and Peter says it. Just as I'm reaching the conclusion myself, he outsmarted the others, says Peter. I nod and then let the conversation drop, but secretly I'm wondering if Hamish should sobered up long enough to help Peta and me because he thought we just might have the wits to survive. Okay, so we're going to go over here. We're going to grab this right here. He's outsmarted the others, said Peta. We're going to say, ah, uh, Peta and Katniss know that Hamish must have outsmarted the other tributes. We put the evidence in. That, of course, follows our theme of survival. You know it. Back. I nod, then the let the conversation drop. Oh, I forgot to look at the... Okay, the next one. Why does Katniss call Thresh's death a murder? Here we go. I nod, then I let the conversation drop, but secretly I'm wondering if Hamish sobered up long enough to keep help Peta and me because he thought he just might have the wits to survive. Maybe he hasn't always drunk. Maybe in the beginning when he tried to help the tributes. But then got the, it got to be unbearable. It must be hell to mentor kids and then watch them die. Year after year after year, I realized that if I got get out of here... I will be, that will become my job, to mentor the girl from District 12. The idea is so repellent I thrust it from my mind. But half an hour has passed before I decide I have to eat again. Pete is too hungry himself to put up the argument. While we're dishing up two more small servings of lamb stew and rice, we hear the anthem begin to play. Pete presses his eyes against the crack of the rocks and watch the sky. 
There won't be anything to see tonight, I say. Far more interested in the stew than the sky. Nothing's happened, and we wouldn't, or we would have heard a cannon. Katniss? Peter says quietly. What? Should we split another roll, too, I asked? Katniss, he repeats, but I find myself wanting to ignore him. I'm going to split one, but I'll save the cheese for tomorrow, I say. I see Peter staring at me. What? Thresh is dead, says Peter. He can't be, I say. They must have fired the cannon during the thunder, and we missed it, said Peter. Are you sure? I mean, it's pouring buckets out there. I don't know how you could see anything, I say, and I push him from the rocks and squint out to the rock, dark, rainy sky. And for about ten seconds, I catch the distorted glimpse of Thrush's picture, and then he's gone, just like that. I slump down against the rocks momentarily, forgetting about the task at hand. Thrush is dead. I should be happy, right? One less tribute to face, and a powerful one, too. But I'm not happy. All I can think about Thrush is letting go me go, letting me run because of Rue who died with a spear in her stomach. Are you all right? Asks Peta. I give a non-commental shrug and cut my elbows to my hands, hugging them close to my body. I have to bury the real pain because it's going to bet on a tribute who keeps sniveling over the deaths of her opponents. Rue was one thing. We were allies. She was young, so young. But no one would understand my sorrow at Thresh's murder. The word pulls me up short. Murder. Thankfully, I didn't say it aloud. That's not going to win me any points in the arena. What I do say is, it's just, if we didn't win, I wanted Thresh to. Because he let me go. Because of Rue. Okay, we're going to stop right there, and we've got our little thing right there. Yay! Now, why does Katniss, th Katniss call Thresh's death a murder? Because Katniss is starting to see the games as reality, not the propaganda the capital makes it be. These aren't tributes, these are people. These aren't you know, victories, these are deaths, these are murders. And she starts seeing Thresh not as an opponent, not a real person. She sees him as a real person. He saves her. So therefore, when he dies, Cato murdered him. We can use the, the quote that we just got. And of course, that definitely, definitely can fall into a couple of themes. It's definitely survival, but it's also perceptions. It's more strongly perceptions. Because she now perceives Thresh as a human being, his death is a murder. Why doesn't Katniss want to marry? Why doesn't Katniss want to marry or have children? I think we can all guess why, but we gotta find the evidence. Yeah, I know, says Peta. But that means you're one step clo we're one step closer to District Twelve. And he nudges a plate of food into my hands. Eat, it's still warm. I take a bite of stew to show I don't really care, but it's like glue in my mouth and takes a lot of effort to swallow. It also means Kato will be back hunting us. He's got supplies again, says Peta. He'll be wounded, I bet, I say. What does you? What makes you say that, Peter says, because Thresh would have never gone down without a fight. He's so strong, I mean, he was. And this, they were in his territory, I say. Good, says Peter. The more wounded Cato is, the better. I wonder how Foxface is making out. Oh, she's fine, I say peevishly. I'm still angry that she thought of hiding the cornucopia, and I didn't. Probably be easier to catch Cato than her. Maybe they'll catch each other, and we can just go home. Well, we better be extra careful about watches. I dozed off a few times. Me too, I admitted. But not tonight. We finish our food in silence, and when Peter offers to take first watch, I burrow down to the sleeping bag next to him, pulling my hood up over my face to hide from the cameras. I just need a few minutes of privacy where I can let my emotions cross my face without being seen. Under the hood, I silently say goodbye to Thresh and thank him for my life. I promise to remember him, if I can, and do something to help his family and ruse if I win. Then I escape into sleep, comforted by a full belly and a steady warmth of Peta beside me. We can definitely use this for that thrush one because victors don't help other tributes who died. And she's already thinking, you know, thrush and rue, we got to do something for them. When Peter wakes me later, the first thing I register is the smell of goat cheese. He's holding out half a roll spread with the creamy white stuff topped with apple slices. Don't be mad, he says. I had to eat again. Here's your half. Oh, good, I say, and immediately take a huge bite. The strong, fatty cheese tastes just like the kind Prim makes, and the apples are sweet and crunchy. Mmm. We, we make goat cheese and apple tart at the bakery, he says. Bet that's expensive, I say. Too expensive for my family to eat, unless it's gone to very stale. Of course, practically everything we eat is stale, says Peta, pulling the sleeping bag up around him. In less than a minute, he's snoring. Huh, I always assume shopkeepers live the soft life. But it's true, Peter's always had enough to eat, but there's something kind of depressing about living your life on stale bread, the hard, dry loaves that no one else wanted. One thing about us, since I bring our food home on a daily basis, most of it's fresh, and you still have to make sure that it isn't going to make a run for it. 
What are we? Oh yeah. Why doesn't she want to get married? Okay. Sorry. My bad. Somewhere during my, somewhere during my shift, the rain stops, not gradually, but all at once. The downpour ends and there's only a residual drippings of water from the branches. The rush of now overflows stream below us. A full, beautiful moon emerges and even without the glasses, I can see outside. I can't decide the moon is real or merely a projection of the game makers. I know it's full and shortly before I left home and Gail and I watched this, watch it rise as we hunted into the late hours. How long have I been gone? I'm guessing it's been about two weeks in the arena. And there was a week of preparation at the Capitol. Maybe the moon has completely completed its cycle. For some reason, I, ba I badly want it to be my moon. The same one I see from the woods around District 12. And that would give me something to cling to in the surreal world of the arena, where the authenticity of everything is doubted. Four of us left. Okay, I'm going to pause right there for a second, but be right back. Sorry, guys. I'm back. For the first time, I allow myself to truly think about the possibility that I might make it home to the fame, to wealth, to my own house in the Victor's Village. My mother and Prim would live there with me. No more fear of hunger, a new kind of freedom. But then what? What would my life be like on a daily basis? Most of it has been consumed with the acquisition of food. Make that anyway, take that anyway, that away. And I'm not really sure what I am, what my identity is. The idea scares me some, and I think of Hamish with all his money, what did his life become? He lives alone, no wife, no children. Most of his waking hours drunk. I don't want to end up like that. But you won't be alone, I whispered to myself. I have my mother and Prim. Well, for the first, for the time being. And then, I don't want to think about that then. When Prim has grown up and my mother passed away, I know I'll never marry. Never risk bringing a child into the world. Because if there's one thing being a victor doesn't guarantee is that your children's safety. My kids' names would go right into the reaping balls with everyone else's, and I swear I'll never let that happen. The sun eventually rises. Okay, we're going to stop right there. We definitely want to grab this right here and utilize it. And we have it right here. Why doesn't Katniss want to marry and have children? Because she never wants her children to end up in the games. We have our evidence in the quote we just said, and of course that theme totally goes to dystopian society. Why is Peter a terrible hunter? Here we go. The sun eventually rises, its light slipping through the cracks, eliminating Peter's face. Who will the tra who will he transform into when we make it home? This perplexing, good-natured boy who can spin out lies so convincingly. The whole of Pan Am believes him to be hopelessly in love with me, and I'll admit it. There are moments when he makes me believe it myself. <laughs> At least we'll be friends, I think. Nothing will change the fact that we'll have saved each other's lives in here. And beyond that, he will always be the boy with the bread. Good friends. Anything beyond that, though. And I, I feel Ga Gail's gray eyes watching me, watching Peta, all the way to District 12. Discomfort causes me to move, and I scoot over and shake Peta's shoulder. His eyes open sleepily, and when they focus on me, he pulls me down for a long kiss. We're wasting hunting time, I say, when I finally break away. I wouldn't call it wasting, he says, giving a big stretch as he sits up. So do we hunt and empty our st on an empty stomachs to give us an edge? Not us, I say. We stuff ourselves and give us power. Count me in, Peter says. But I can see that he's surprised when I divide the rest of the stew and rice and his hand am a heaping plate to him. All this? We've earned, we'll earn it back today, I say, and we both plow into our plates. Even cold, it's one of the best things I've ever tasted. I abandon my fork and scrape up the last dibs of gravy with my finger, and I can feel Effie Trinket shuddering at my manners. Hey, Effie, watch this, says Peter as he tosses his fork over his shoulder and literally licks his plate clean with his tongue making loud, satisfying sounds. Then he blows a kiss out to ensure generate in, in tour in general. We miss you, Effie. I cover his mouth with my hand, but we're, I'm laughing. Stop. Kato could be right outside their cave. He grabs my hand. What do I care? I've got you to protect me now, says Peter, pulling me to him. Come on, I say with an exasperation, extracting myself from his grasp, but not before he gets in another kiss. Once we've packed up and standing outside the cave, our mood shifts to, to be to serious. It's as though for the last few days, sheltered by the rocks and the rain that Cato's preoccupation with Thresh, we were given respite, a holiday of sorts. Now, although the day is sunny and warm, we both sense that we're really back in the games. I hand Peter my knife, since whatever weapons we once had are no longer gone, are no lo are long gone, and he slips it into his belt. My last seven arrows, of the twelve I sacrificed, three in the explosion, two at the feast. 
I rattle a bit too loosely in the quiver, and I can't afford to lose any more. He'll be hunting us by now, says Peta. Cato isn't one to wait for his prey to wander by. If he's wounded, I begin. It wouldn't matter, says Peta breaks in. If he can move, he's coming. With all the rain, and the stream was overrun its banks by several feet on either side. We stopped there to replenish our water, and I checked the snares set a few days ago come up empty. Not surprising with the weather. Besides, I haven't seen any animals or signs of them in this area. If we want food, we better head back to up to the old hunting grounds, I say. Your call. Let Just tell me what you need me to do, says Peta. Keep an eye out, I say. Stay on the rocks as much as possible. No sense in leaving him tracks to follow. And listen for both of us. It's clear at this point that the explosion destroyed the hearing in my left ear for good. I had walked in, I had walked in the water to cover our tracks completely, but I am not sure Peter's leg could take the current. Although the drugs have in, eased, erased the infection, he's still plenty weak. My forehead hurts along the knife cut, but after three days of bleeding, it stopped. I wear a bandage around my head, though, just in case the physical exertion brings it back. As we head up the long side of the stream, we go long pa we pass the place where I found Peter camouflaged in the weeds and mud. One good thing, between the downpour and the flooded banks, and all signs of his hiding place have been wiped out. That means that if we need to, if need be, we can come back to our cave. Otherwise, it wouldn't risk it after Kato, with Cato after us. The boulders diminish the rocks to rocks that eventually turn into pebbles, and then to my relief, there we're back on pine needles and a gentle incline to the forest floor. For the first time, I realize that we have a problem. Navigating the rocky terrain is with a bad leg, well, you're naturally going to make some noise. But even on the smooth bed of needles, Peter is loud. And I mean loud, loud. As if he's stomping his feet or something. I turn and look at him. What? He asks. You've got to move more quietly, I say. Forget about Cato. You're chasing off every rabbit in a ten-mile radius. Really? He says. Sorry, I didn't know. So we start up again with a tiny bit better, but even with only one working ear, he's making me jump. Can you take your boots off, I suggest? Here? He asks in disbelief. Okay, so now we know he's super, super loud. Now I'm going to pause real quick because I have to talk to, a to talk to a student. Okay, so now we know. Peter is a terrible hunter because he is so loud. But he's so loud because he's never had to do it before. He's never had to hunt for his food. It's always been brought to him. His family does have money. So he's just never learned any of this evidence we just have our quote that we just got from right now and then of course that theme really is all about survival <laughs> um Vita is not made to survive by himself in the games he's just not he's moved from one alliance to the other and the only time he doesn't have an alliance that's when he's in a position where he's dying on the riverbed so we know that yeah he's one of those people who really needs somebody else Okay, our last one. Who killed Foxface? Oh, who kills Foxface now? Here we go, guys. Back over. There we go. He asks in disbelief, as if I've asked him to walk barefoot on hot coals or something. I have to remind myself he's still not used to the woods. That it's scary, forbidden place, beyond the fences of District 12. I think of Gale, which is with his velvet tread. It's eerie how little sound he makes, even when the leaves, the leaves are fallen. And it's a challenge to move at all, without chasing off game. I feel certain he's laughing back home. Yes, I say patiently, I will too. That way we'll both be quieter, like I was making any noise. So we both strip off our boots and socks, and while there's some improvement, I could swear he's making an effort to snap every branch we encounter. Needless to say, although it takes several hours to reach our old camp with Rue, I'll sh I've shot nothing. If the stream would settle down, the fish might be an option, but the current is still too strong. As we stop to rest the drink and drink water, I try to work out a solution. Ideally, I dump Pete in now with some simple root-gathering chore and go hunt. But when he's left with only a knife to defend himself against Kato's spears and super strength. So what I'd really like to do is try and conceal him somewhere safe and then go hunt and come back and collect him. But I have a feeling his ego isn't going to go for that suggestion. Katniss, he says, we need to split up. I know I'm chasing away the game. Only because your leg is hurt, I say gener generously. Because really you can tell it's only a small part of the problem. I know. So why don't you go on? Show me some plants together and that way we'll both be useful. Not if Cato comes to kill you. I try to say in a nice way, but it still sounds like he's he's a weakling. Surprisingly, he just laughs. Look, I can handle Cato. I fought him before, didn't I? Yeah, and that turned out great. You ended up dying in a mud bank. That's what I want to say, but I can't. He didn't save my life by taking on Cato after all. 
oh, sorry, he did save my life by taking, uh, taking on Kato after all. I try another tactic. What if you climb up in a tree and act as lookout while I hunt it, I say, trying to make it sound like a very important work. What if you show me what's edible around here and go get us some meat, he says, mimicking my tone. Just don't go far in case you need help. I sigh. I showed him some roots to dig. We need just food, no question. One apple, two rolls, and a blob of cheese the size of a plum won't last long. I just got a short distance and hope Cato is not long off. And hope Cato is long off. I teach him a bird whistle, not a melody like Ruse, but a simple two-note whistle, which he can use to communicate that we're all right. Fortunately, he's got good at this. Leaving him with the pack, I head off. I feel like I'm 11 again, tethered not to the safety of the fence, but to PETA, allowing myself 20... Oh, water. Oh, 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 bad man. I feel like I'm 11 again, tethered to the safety of the fence, but to, P but to PETA, allowing myself 20, maybe 30 yards of hunting space. Away from him, though the woods come alive with animal sounds, reassured by his, his periodic whistles, I allow myself to drift farther away as soon as two rabbits had a fat squirrel to show for it. I decided it's enough, and I can set snares and maybe some and get some fish. But PETA's roots, this will be enough. To, with PETA's roots, this will be enough for now. As I travel a short distance back, I realize that we haven't exchanged signals in a while. When my whistle receives no response, I run. In no time, I find the pack, a neat pile of roots beside it, a sheet of plastic that's been laid on the ground where the sun can reach a single layer of berries that covers it. But where is he? PETA? I call in a, PETA in a panic. PETA! I turn to, uh, turn to the rustle of a bush and almost send an arrow through him. Fortunately, I pull my, pull my bow at the last second, and it sticks to an oak trunk in his left. He jumps back, flinging a handful of berries into the foliage. My fear comes out as anger. What are you doing? You're supposed to be here, not running around in the woods. I found some berries down by the stream, he says, clearly confused by my outburst. I whistled. Why didn't you whistle back? I snap at him. I didn't hear the water's too loud, I guess, he says. He, cro he crosses and puts his hands on my shoulders. That's when I feel that I'm trembling. I thought Kato killed you. I almost shout. No, I'm fine. Peta wraps his arms around me, but I don't respond Katniss. I push away, trying to sort out my feelings. If two people agree on a signal, they stay in range, because if one of them doesn't answer, they're in trouble, all right? All right, he says, all right. Because that's what happened to Rue, and I watched her die, I say. I turn away from him to go to the pack to open a fresh bottle of water, although I still don't. I still have some in mind, but I'm not really. I'm not ready to forgive him. I notice the food, the rolls and apples are untouched, but someone's definitely picked away at part of the cheese. You ate without me, I said. I I really don't care. I just want something else to be mad about. What? No, I didn't. Oh, I suppose apples ate the cheese. I say. I don't know what ate the cheese. Peter says slowly, distinctly, as if trying not to lose his temper. But it wasn't me. And I've been down by the stream collecting berries. Would you care for some? I would actually, but I don't want to relent too soon. I do walk over and look at them. But I've, I've never seen these type before. No, I have. But not in the arena. These aren't bruise berries. Although they resemble them. Nor do they match any that I have learned about in the training. I lean down and scoop up a few, rolling them between my fingers. My father's voice comes back to me. Not these, Katniss. Never these. They're nightlock. You'll be dead before they reach your stomach. Okay, this is actually a mutt, a mutation that the capital has created. It's nightshade and hemlock, both of which are very poisonous plants, both of which grow in the valley. Just then, the cannon fires. I whip around, expecting Peter to collapse to the ground, but he only raises his eyebrows. The hovercraft appears a hundred yards or so away. That what's left of Fox Face's emaciated body is lifted into the air. I can see the red glint of her hair in the sunlight. I should have known the moment I saw the missing cheese. Peter ha it was, has me by the arm, pushing me towards a tree. Climb. He'll be here any second. We'll stand better chance fighting for him from above. I stop him, and suddenly I call, No, Peter. She's your kill, not Cato's. What? I haven't seen her since the first, since, uh, since the first day, he says. How could have I killed her? In answer, I hold out the berries. It takes a while to explain the situation to Peter. How Foxface stole the food from the supply pile by blowing the, before I blew it up. How she tried to make enough, take enough to stay alive, but not enough for anyone to notice it. How she wouldn't question the safety of berries we were preparing to eat ourselves. I wonder how she found us, says Peter. My fault, I guess. If I'm as loud as you say. We are about as hard to follow as a herd of cattle, but I try to be kind. She's very clever, Peter. Well, she was, until you outfoxed her. Not on purpose. Doesn't seem fair somehow. I mean, 
We would have had both been dead, too, if she hadn't eaten the fairies first, he chokes himself. No, of course we wouldn't. You recognize them, didn't you? I gave a nod. We call them Nightlock. Even the name sounds deadly, he says. Sorry, Katniss. I really thought they were same, the, the, ones that you, the same ones that you'd gathered. Don't apologize. It just means you're one, we're one step closer to home, right? I'll get rid of the rest, Peter says. He gathers up the sheet of blue plastic, careful to trap the berries inside, and goes and tosses them into the woods. Wait, I cry. I find a leather pouch that belongs to the boy in District 1 and fill it with a few handfuls of berries from the plastic. They out, if they fooled Foxface, maybe they'll fool Cato too. If he's chasing after us or something, we can act like we accidentally dropped the pouch when he, and if he eats them. Hello, District 12, says Peta. Okay, we're going to go finish that last little bit right here. Who kills Foxface? Peta kills Foxface by accidentally poisoning her. We have our evidence just right there. And the theme, of course, is survival. Okay, let's go to our last slide. Slide six. Isn't it awesome? Okay, guys, chapter 24. Here we go. Things start to really liven up. As you read chapter 24, answer the following questions. Why does Katniss kiss Peta's forehead as he drops off to sleep? Why does Katniss believe that the end of the game is near? How does the capital force the remaining players together? Why does Cato attack Katniss and Peta? Now, guys, if you take a look down here, it tells you complete a collage on the right-hand side. Use what you have read this week to show your understanding. So this is where you can put your collage this week. Then over here, we have our questions. Let's go. We're almost done, guys. We're almost done. That's it, I said, securing the pouch to my belt. He'll know where we are now, says Peta. If he was anywhere nearby and saw the hovercraft, he'll know we killed her and come for after us. Peta's right. This could be just the opportunity Kate has been waiting for. But even if we run now, there's no, there's the meat to cook, and our fire will be another sign of our whereabouts. Let's make a fire right now. I begin to gather branches and a brush. You ready to face him, says Peta? Ready to eat. Better to cook our food while we have a chance. If he knows we're here, he knows. But he also knows that there's two of us and probably assumes we're we were hunting Foxface. That means you're recovered, and the fire means that we're not hiding. We're inviting him here. Would you show up? I asked. Maybe not, he says. Pete is a whiz with fires, cooks in the blaze out of the damp wood in no time. I have the rabbits and the squirrel roasting, the roots wrapped in leaves, baking in the coals. We take turns gathering greens and keeping careful watch for Cato. But as anticipated, he doesn't make an appearance. When the food's cooked, I pack most of it up, leaving each of us a rabbit leg to eat while we walk. I want to move higher into the woods, climb to a good tree, and make a camp for the night. But Peta resists. I can't climb like you, Katniss, especially with my leg. And I don't think I could ever fall asleep there 50 feet above the ground. It's not safe to stay in the open, Peta, I say. Can't we go back to the cave, he asks. It's near water, easy to defend. I sigh. Several more hours of walking, or should I say crashing through the woods to reach an area, we'll just have to leave in the morning to hunt. But Peta doesn't ask for much. He's followed my instructions all day, and I'm sure if things were reversed, he would take he would he wouldn't make me spend the night in a tree. It dawns on me that I haven't been very nice to Peta today, nagging him about how loud he was, screaming at him for over disappearing. The playful romance we had sustained in the cave was disappear disappeared out in the open under the hot sun, with a threat of Cato looming over us. Himmich has probably just about had it with me, and as for the audience, I reach up and give him a kiss. Sure, let's go back to the cave. He looks pleased and relieved. Well, that was easy. I work my arrow, arrow out of the oak, careful not to damage the shaft. These arrows are food, safety, and life itself now. We toss a bunch more wood on the fire. It should be sending off smoke for a few more hours, although I doubt Cato assumes anything at this point. When we reach the stream, I see the water has dropped considerably and moves at a leisurely place, so I suggest we walk back in it. Pete is happy to oblige, and since he's a lot quieter in the water than on land, it's doubly a good idea. It's a long walk back to the cave, though, even going downward, even with the rabbit giving us a boost. We're both exhausted by the time our hike, from our hike today and still, and still way too underfed. I keep my bow loaded, both for Cato and any fish I might see, but the stream seems strangely empty of creatures. By the time we reach our destination, our feet are dragging and the sun sits low in the horizon. We fill up our water bottles and climb to the little slope of our den. It's not much, but out here in the wilderness, it's the closest thing we have to home. It will be warmer than the tree, too, because it provides some shelter from the wind and has begun to blow steadily from the west. I set a good dinner out, but halfway through, Peter begins to nod off. 
After days of inactivity, the hunt has taken its toll. I order him into the sleeping bag and set aside the rest of his food for when he wakes. He drops off immediately, and I pull the sleeping bag up to his chin and kiss his forehead, not for the audience, but for me, because I am grateful that he's still here, not dead in the stream, as, of, as I thought. So glad that I didn't have to face Cato alone. So, why does Katniss kiss Pizza's forehead before she drops off? He's just like, thank, it's like, a, it's like, thank you. It's like, I'm so glad that you're still here. It's a lot of all of that because, again, it's very much, um, she's coming to the realization that even with all of her trust issues, she needs PETA. And she's very happy she doesn't have to face the last of the tributes, the most deadly of the tributes by herself. Why does Katniss believe that the end of the games are near? We, the author has already given us a couple of hints as to why the end of the games are near, but we'll check back and look at them in retrospective. Brutal, bloody Cato, who can snap the neck with a twist of his arm, who had a powerful, who has had the power to overcome Thresh, who has had it out for me since the beginning. He's probably had a special hatred for me ever since I outscored him in the training. A boy like Peta would simply shrug it off, but I have had I have a feeling it drove Cato to distraction, which is not that hard. I think of his ridiculous reaction to finding the supplies blown up. The others were upset, of course, but he was completely unhinged. I wonder now if Cato might not be entirely sane. The sky lights up the seal, and I watch Foxface shine in the sky, then disappear from the world forever. He hasn't said it, but I don't think Peta felt good about killing her, even if it was essential. I can't pretend I'll miss her, but I have to admire her. My guess is that they had given us some sort of test. She would have been the smartest of us all, of all the tributes, if, in fact, we had been setting a trap for her. I bet she'd have sensed it and avoided the berries. It was Peta's own ignorance that brought her down. I've spent so much time making sure I don't underestimate the opponents that I've forgotten it's not just as dangerous to overestimate them as well. What brings me back, to, that brings me back to Cato. But while I think I had a sense for a fox face, who she was and how she operated, he's a little more slippery, powerful, well-trained, but smart? I don't know. Well, not like she was. And utterly lacking in the, in the control of fox face demonstrated, I mean, that's a lot of control, people. She was starving, but still didn't go in and take everything. She still was trying to win the games. Pardon me. I believe Cato could easily lose his judgment in a fit of temper. Not that I can feel superior at that point. I think the moment I sent the arrow flying into the apple of the pig's mouth was when I was, also, when I was so enraged. Maybe I do understand Cato better than I think. Despite the fatigue of my body and my mind's alert, so I set, let Pita sleep long past our usual watch. In fact, a soft gray has begun when I shake his shoulder. He looks out almost in alarm. I slept the whole night? That's not fair, Katniss. You should have woken me. I stretch and burrow down into the sleeping into the bag. I'll sleep now. Wake me if anything interesting happens. Apparently nothing does, because when I open my eyes, bright, hot afternoon sun gleams through the rocks. Any sign of our friend, I ask? Peter shakes his head. No, he's keeping a disturbingly low profile. How long do you think we'll be we'll have before the game makers drive us together? I asked. Well, Foxface died almost a day ago, so that's been plenty of time for the audience to pace bets and get bored. I guess it'll happen any moment, he says, Peta. Yeah, I have a feeling today's the day, I say. I sit up and look out at the peaceful terrain. I wonder how they'll do it. Peter remains silent, but there's not really any good answer. Well, until they do, no sense in wa wasting a hunting day. But we should probably eat as much as we can to hold in case we run into trouble, I say. Peter packs up our gear while I lay out a big meal. The rest of the rabbits, roots, greens, the roll spread with the last bit of cheese. The only thing I leave to reserve is the squirrel and the apple. By the time we're done, all that's left in the pile of rabbit bones. My hands are greasy, which only adds to my growing feeling of grubbiness. Maybe we won't bathe daily in the seam, but we keep cleaner than I have at late. Except for my feet, which have walked in the stream. I'm covered in a layer of grime. Leaving the cave is a sense of fine finality about it. I don't think we will be another night in the arena somehow. One way or the other, dead or alive, I have a feeling I'll escape it today. I give the rocks a pat goodbye, and we head down to the stream to wash up. But I can feel the, my skin itching with, for cool, cool water. I may do my hair and braid it back wet. I'm wondering if we might be able to give our clothes a quick scrub when we reach the stream, or what used to be the stream. Now there's only one bone-dry bed. I put my hand down and fill it. Not even a little damp. They must have drained it while we slept, I say. 
A fear of cracked tongue, aching body, and fuzzy mind brought back my pre previous dehydration creeps into my consciousness. Our bottles and skin are fairly full, but with two drinking and this hot sun, it won't take long to dissipate them. The lake, says Peta. That's where they want us to go. Okay, let's go back to our questions. Why does Katniss believe this is the end of the games is near? Because it's down to the last three. Foxface is dead, and that's death. Now everybody's had time to place bets, think about strategies, who's going to win, and now it's the time to end it. On Still on a high note, before it gets boring. How does the capital force the remaining players together? They get rid of all the other water. They drain the stream, and now the only water is the lake, and the lake's next to the cornucopia, which probably has the best cameras. So it's time to get going. Here we go. Maybe the pond still have some, I said, hopefully. We can check, he says, but he's just humoring me. I'm humoring myself because I know that I'll find when I return to the pond where I soaked my leg. A dusty, gaping mouth of a hole. When we make the trip anyway, just to confirm what I already know. You're right. They're driving us to the lake, I say. There's no cover. Where they're guaranteed a bloody fight to the death with nothing but blo uh, to block their view. Do you want to go straight away or wait until the water's tapped out? Let's go now. While we have food and... <laughs> while we've had food and rest. Let's just go and end this thing, he says. I nod. It's funny. I feel almost as if the first day of the games is again. <laughs> first day of the games again. That I'm in the same position, 21 tributes are dead, but I still have to yet to kill Cato. And already, hasn't the, he already, hasn't he always been the one to kill? Now it seems that the other tributes are just minor obstacles, distractions, keeping us from the real battle of the games, Cato and me. But no, there's a boy waiting beside me. I feel his arms wrap around me. Two against one. Should be a piece of cake, he says. Next time we eat, it'll be in the capital, I answer. You bet it will. We stand there for a while, locked in an embrace, feeling each other. The sunlight, the rustle of the leaves at our feet. Then without a word, we break apart and head for the lake. I don't care how now that Peta's footfalls send rodents scurrying, make the birds take wing. We have to fight Cato, and it's just as soon do it as here is in the plain. But I doubt I'll have a choice. If the game makers want us in the open, then the open it will be. We stop to rest for a few moments. Wait one second, I got his knees. Sorry. We stopped to race west for a few moment, moments, under the tree where the carriers trapped me. The husk of the tracker jacker nest, beaten to a pulp by heavy rains and dried in the burning sun, confirms the location. I touch it with the tip of my boot, and it dissolves into dust that is quickly carried off by the breeze. I can't help looking up at the tree where Rue secretly perched, waiting to save my life. Tracker jackers, glimmer's bloated body, the terrifying hallucinations. Let's move on, I say. Waiting to escape the darkness that surrounds the place, Peta doesn't object. Given our late start in the day, when we reach the plane, it's already early evening. There's no sign of Cato, no sign of anything except the gold cornucopia glowing in the slanting sun rays. Just in case Cato decided to pull a fox face on us, we circle the cornucopia to make sure it's empty. Then obediently, as of following instructions, we cross to the lake and fill our water containers. I follow the sinking sun. We don't want to fight him after dark. There's only one pair of glasses. Peta carefully squeezes drops of iodine into the water. Maybe that's what he's waiting for. What do you want to do? Go back to the cave? Neither, either that or find a tree. But let's give him another half an hour or so. Then we'll take over. Then we'll take cover. I answer. We sit by the lake in full, in full sight. There's no point in hiding now. In the trees at the end of the plain, I can see the mockingjays flitting about, bouncing melodies back and forth between them like brightly colored balls. I open my mouth to sing out Rue's four-note run. I can feel them pause curiously at the sound of my voice, listening for more. I repeated the notes in silent to in, in the silence. First one mocking jay trills the tune back, then another. Then the whole world comes alive with the sound. Just like your father, says Peta. My fingers find the pin in my shirt. That's Ruth's song, I say. I think they remember it. The music swells and I recognize the brilliance of it. As the notes overlap, they can complement one another, forming a lovely unearth unearthly harmony. It was this sound then, thanks to Rue, that sent the orchard workers to the District 11 to home each night. Does someone start it, start it at quitting time, I wonder, now that she's dead? For a while, I just close my eyes and listen, mesmerized by the beauty of the song. Then something begins to disrupt the music, runs off in a jagged, imperfect lines, dissonant notes interspersed in the melody. The mocking jay's voices rise up in a shrieking cry of alarm. We're on our feet, Peter wielding his knife, me poised to shoot. When Cato smashes through the trees and bears down on us, he has no spear. In fact, his hands are empty, yet he runs straight for us. My first arrow hits his chest and unexpectedly falls aside. He's got some kind of body armor, shouts Peta. Just in time, too, because Cato is upon us. I brace myself, but he rockets past between us. 
with no attempt to check his speed. I can tell from his panting and sweating pouring off his purplish face that he's been running hard for a long time. Not towards us, but from something. But what? My eyes scan just in time to see the first creature leap into the plane. As I'm turning away, I see another half dozen join it. Then I am scrambling blindly after Cato with no thought of anything but to save myself. Okay, so why doesn't Cato attack Cadmus and Peta? He's too busy trying to like run away from something really bad in the woods. And the movie makers had to completely change this because it's really gruesome. And we'll find out more about it next week. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, have a nice day.